Hi everyone and welcome once again to one of our virtual events. We are very excited today to have a, one of the um, amazing people from TAMU CT, Texas A&M, Central Texas. We have with us today, Margaret Dawson, and she is co-head of Public Services and Outreach. And she is also a horse owner. And I knew she was a horse owner. And when somebody suggested this event, I knew exactly who to call. So um, Margaret, welcome. Thank you for agreeing to do this with us. Um, do you want me, do you want to say hi before I start your video? Cause she made hi, a video. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to play the video that she pre-recorded because she said what, that there's no internet at the horse tables. <laughs> so, all right. Let me. Get it going. All righty. Welcome to Horse Ownership Do's and Don'ts. My name is Margaret Dawson, and I'll be talking to you about horse ownership and other horse-related information today. This is a picture of my current horse. His main job is distance riding, which is endurance. And this is from one of our endurance rides. And it was very nice uh, ride, and but he is not happy in this particular picture because I was asking him to slow down because we were sponsoring a junior who was right behind us, so he couldn't go as fast as he wanted to. I have spent over 33 years involved with horses in some capacity. I've been a barn manager, a vet tech, and I've competed and shown in English and Western disciplines. This is a picture of my first horse. He, in this picture, was around three years old and an Arabian stallion, which is not what most people should start out with as their first horse but we were very lucky. We had a very good trainer for us both, and he was an amazing horse, so it worked out. But that's not what we want most people to have as a first horse, because it is usually the recipe for disaster. So do you actually want to own them? They are very expensive and they need many things. Uh, they're really the most expensive pet you can have besides an exotic. And sometimes they're more expensive even than them. So you need to pay for board or have them at your own property, which is also, of course, expensive. You need to pay for the vet when they get sick and for general maintenance and a farrier. So farriers do their horse's feet. So and you need that done uh, usually between five and six weeks. So that's a reoccurring expense. So this meme has been going around social media for a little while. And so they cost, they cost everything and your soul, which is pretty much true. So before you buy, um, you can decide how you want to ride. And there's lots of different kinds of riding which you can choose from. Taking lessons is always a good way to start out. So even the best Olympic riders take lessons. So it's something that you should do too. Long ago, if you were in, into camp, scout camp, some other day camp, and you rode around on a horse for a few minutes for a week when you were 10, and that was 20 years ago, that doesn't really count. So to actually learn how to ride and to care for a horse, you can take lessons. So lessons can also involve the caretaking aspect of horses also. There's horsemanship classes that you can take that tell you 
about how to care for them, how to feed them, how to groom them, and all those things that are also necessary besides the writing part. So all of those things are good to learn. So if you wanted to learn to do this, so this is barrel racing. So you go very fast in a quarterly pattern. And you need to have a good seat. If you can see, uh, she has um, a pretty solid seat and she's going at a very fast gallop, which is what barrel racing does. And it's timed, so the shortest amount of time that you can do the quarterly barrel pattern, you win. This is an example of show jumping. Show jumping is one of the highest jumping efforts you can do with your horse. So it obviously requires a great deal of athleticism from both horse and rider. Not only do you need to stay on when you are jumping, but also when you land. The force that happens when you land can very easily have someone not stay on their horse if you don't need to which is why people who jump at this level have been taking many lessons and riding and practicing for many years. So this is the what you want to start with. So this is a regular lesson. Uh, this is an English example as the person is riding with an English saddle and your instructor is standing and you know, they could also be mounted and giving her uh, instructions on where to put her hands, her feet, and what she should be doing with them. The rider who's taking the lesson is wearing a helmet, which is a good safety measure. Some barns and some lessons require a helmet. Others do not, but it's a good safety aspect to have. Horse riding is a dangerous activity, even if you're on a safe and quiet horse, and even the safest and quietest horse can trip and fall, and you can land on your head. So to help that, you wear a riding helmet. You can also by other protective gear that goes on your body, such as a vest. And now they even have air vests that inflate and help cushion your fall when you come off. So all of those things are things to think about when you start riding. You can also do research. So there's lots of things that you can read. Uh, these are some examples of both books and magazines. So you've got one uh, on Western writing and one on English writing. So the two books are the ones at the top. The Western writing is book is actually from one of the magazines that they published. So it's a good reputable source. And the English writing is from a good publisher and is written by writers who've been doing it for many years. The two bottom ones are to two magazines and you can read them in both print and online. So Horse and Rider is the Western magazine and you can see um, he's sitting in a Western saddle and it's one of the top Western magazines. The other is Western Horseman, which has been around for many, many years. Equus is a general interest magazine. So it has articles on horse care, riding, breeds. So a wide variety of subjects. So it's not riding specific. It covers a lot of topics. There's also, of course, the general things on the general internet. So YouTube, uh, general web pages, things like that. So there is a lot 
out there that is not <laughs> correct about horses, just like there's, you know, anybody can put anything on them. So you do want to be cautious of things that you read. So you want to make sure that you're reading them from a solid, reputable source. So both of the magazine, Horse and Rider and Equus, also have a website that has many articles that you can read for free. But getting a subscription is a good way to get started. And then you can go back and refer to it in the print form. So they're all alternatives to horse ownership. Leasing is one of the most common ones. So you pay for the use of the horse, but you don't own them. So you don't incur the purchase price. So you can ride on certain days. Um, you can take them to shows. So it really depends on you and the owner as to what you pay part of. So you could pay part of boarding. Um, you can pay part of their medical bills. You can pay all the above. Sometimes leases require lessons also. So it could be part of the contract that you need to take you know, one or two lessons a week on the leased horse. So that way the trainer has eyes on both of you together. So there's many options to choose from when it comes to leasing. This of me and one of the horses that I leased, uh, Amy. So I leased her to do endurance riding. So when you're purchasing a horse, you want to bring someone knowledgeable with you. So hopefully you're already taking lessons. So the trainer that you're taking lessons from, that would be a good one to bring with you. Uh, if you have a knowledgeable family member or someone else who's been involved with horses, but it's always just good to bring someone with you to have a sounding board and sometimes to be the voice of reason uh, and to talk to you about uh, the horses that you've seen. You want to try out more than one um, and not buy the very first one that you try out because uh, you never know. You know you could come back to that first one after you tried some others and find that that's you no know, one for you. And you always want to watch the owner tack up the horse and ride before you do or the person you bring with you rides uh, to make sure that it's safe. So if the horse, um, you know, uh, bucks off or runs away with their owner, um, that's not a good sign for you, especially as a beginner. Now, if you're an experienced horse person, sometimes that's not a problem and you would buy them anyway. But especially if you're just starting out, that's probably not a good idea. Pre purchase exams are just what they sound like. So you have a vet examine the horse before you purchase them. So the vet will look at the horse's legs and feet, uh, they're, listen to them breathe, listen to their heart, look at their eyes, and just make sure they're generally healthy. A sound horse is one that doesn't limp. And then you've often heard, you know, a lame, things are lame. Well, that's what a horse that limps is. They are lame. Uh, they can be lame in one leg, they can be lame in multiple legs. So it just means that that particular something in that leg or that hoof does not work like it's supposed to and it's causing the horse pain. So don't want to buy one that's already limping. You can also consider adoption and just like for small animals, there's adoption uh, rescues for horses. So you do need to qualify and often you need a recommendation from your trainer, from your farrier, from your vet to qualify. And they also want to look at where the horse will be living. So if you haven't decided on a boarding stable or you haven't made your property horse ready yet, 
you would need to do that before you went through uh, with the adoption because they would want to look at where the horse was living before they let you adopt them. And sometimes it takes, you know, a little bit of time. Other time it's pretty quick. So adoption is just like for small animals, adoption is a good option for many, for large animals too. So adoption is something that you should consider along with purchasing when it comes to buying a horse. So this is a picture of an auction and a horse from an auction. So this is one of the more common auctions, which is the ones that aren't um, high end auctions. They're considered lower end auctions where horses go um, when they exhausted other means of being sold. So uh, these can have, these horses can have many problems. You can see from this picture uh, that she is uh, quite skinny or you know, her hair coat is very poor. So she could have multiple problems. Uh, often when you go to auction, you want to save them all. Uh, you really can't. So that's pretty hard uh, on you as far as your emotions go. So there are the opposite end of auctions, which are high-end auctions. So ranches uh, here in Texas, like the Four Sixes, that you, if you watch Yellowstone, you've heard of that. They have very high-end auctions. So those horses are you know, very well taken care of, and they go for a good amount of money. So if you're looking for a high-end auction, um, there's ones for just about everybody. And the low-end auction, you want to be careful of. So after you buy your horse, uh, they need, of course, some place to live. So uh, if you have your own property, can you make it horse safe? Is it large enough to house a horse? Um, there can be zoning restrictions or rules in your um, in your neighborhood uh, that could determine whether that can happen or not. So most people, or we shouldn't say most people, but uh, many people, uh, board their horse. So you pay someone else to take care of them. And you have a few options here. Uh, they can live in a stall or a pasture or something in between. So this is a picture of my horse, uh, River in Motion, in a large pasture. You can't see the fence. And it's the pasture is roughly 10 acres large. So that's a good size. And there's multiple horses, usually between three and four horses on it at any given time. Uh, they have gotten rid of the grass in this is the front near the gate. So the grass has died, which is very common. And so when it rains, um, this can turn into mud, which is not good. So that's one of the downsides of pasture life. The options of boarding in general, uh, full care is that the boarding stable takes all does the work. Um, they supply the feed. And the, so they're doing all the labor. Partial care is you do some of the care and buy often, you know, some or not all of the feed. Sometimes they feed it, feed the horse for you. Other times you feed one time a day and they feed another time a day. There's lots of different ways that it works. You just need to determine what that is before you get started doing it. Self-care is that you do everything. So the self-care facility, so you're just using their facility, but you take everything else. So you buy all the feed, the hay, and you store it either there or someplace at your house. And you 
do all the seeding. So this isn't as common. Uh, there are a few places uh, locally here in Central Texas that do it, but not many. So full care is the most common boarding option. So this is an example of a typical stall. So the downside of stalls is that they need to be cleaned daily, if not more than once a day. And you need to put down a large amount of bedding so the horse doesn't get wounds from getting up and down. And when they go to the bathroom, that it has, it gets absorbed. So it is more labor to keep a horse in a stall and so therefore it's the more expensive option when a horse is concerned. It's nice that your horse is inside, so they're not getting, you know, excessively muddy. They're uh, there when you want them, and they're you know, not getting in the elements like they would in a pasture. Most barns do a combination in that they spend uh, Part of their day outside in a pasture, sometimes they're called a paddock or a turnout, and then the other times they're in a stall. So, and uh, but that's usually considered stall board. So each barn has a set amount of time that the horses are out. Sometimes that's only an hour or two. Sometimes it's twelve hours. So when you're choosing a boarding stable, that's one of the things that you want to consider and how that would work with your horse and your schedule. So safe living conditions are very important. Uh, horses are extremely accident prone. <laughs> if there's a way for them to get hurt, they will find it. And this is an example of what you don't want. So there's a gap between the wood and the wire. So a horse can easily get themselves, uh, their hoof, their leg stuck in that gap. And the boards are held together with hay string. So that's not very sturdy. Barbed wire is for cows and it can hurt horses badly. So those barbs are to deter cows have a thicker skin than horses do. And so the barbs are to keep a cow away from the fence. So like I said, horses are quite accident prone and they often injure themselves quite badly on barbed wire. So this is an example of a good fence. This is called post and rail. And this one is actually made of vinyl. The only downside is horses will stick their heads through the bottom. As you can see, there's grass growing at the bottom. So, and there's not as much on the inside of the pasture. So they're trying, they're going to stick their head through to get the grass on the other side. They don't often get stuck, but sometimes they do. So, you want to be very careful about how much space is between that bottom board and the ground. This is one of the most expensive to install and to keep. The posts have to be sunk in concrete and it is quite labor intensive to build. It, since it's vinyl, it can also be made of wood but this vinyl one um, does resist. It doesn't uh, break as easily as wood. It doesn't splinter. In the warm climates, like you're here in Texas, it works very well. Um, the green part you see on it is um, a little, you know, just weathering that you can easily wash off with a pressure washer. And it'll look nice and white afterwards, but it's a cosmetic problem. It doesn't mean that it's any less safe or sturdy. The downside to vinyl is that it can splinter if it's in the cold for very long. So uh, in the more 
Earth, you don't see as many vinyl fences as you do here in the warmer climates. Of course, your horse also needs to eat. Uh, many options are available for feed. So uh, the boarding stable will provide feed if you're in full care. And sometimes you get options. Um, it can be a higher calorie and a lower calorie option, uh, things like that. So some don't give any options because they you know, just buy one. It's easier to feed everyone the same amount. So often horses are fed, uh, they talk about scoops. Um, the more scientific way to know exactly what they're eating is to weigh those scoops so you know how many pounds of horse feed they are getting a day. So hay is often fed, uh, we call them flakes, and you can weigh those to see how many pounds your flakes are. An average horse eats roughly 20 pounds or more of hay a day. So the feed itself is, should be kept in closed containers. And these are trash cans with bungee cords. And that's so the rodents and the wildlife don't get in it and eat it. And they can then contaminate it. Contaminated feed will make your horse very sick. And depending on the wildlife that contaminates it, could give them uh, a whole host of nasty diseases that you don't want them to have. So a lot of boarders buy extra feed and hay to give to their horse. Uh, of course, you want to, you know, when you see them, so you give them a little something extra. Some boarding stables don't allow that. So again, it depends on where you are. So open bags like this are something you don't want to do. Um, because it does attract those rodents and wildlife. And uh, you can have an unwelcome surprise in your open bag of feed. And then you would not want to feed it. So that's also a waste of money. The hay in this particular picture is alfalfa, which is one of the higher calorie hays that you can feed. The other is grass hay. So grass hay is lower in calories than alfalfa. And both are easy to find here in Texas. And you can buy it at tractor supply, local food stores, things like that. So there's many options as where to purchase the feed. You also uh, will need things to groom your horse. So brushes um, and a hoof pick are at the minimum. So you can get a curry comb and a stiff brush and a soft brush, or you can get many brushes with many variations of those. A shedding blade is also helpful. So it has metal teeth or plastic teeth that help get that loose hair off them when they are shedding in the spring. It is amazing how much hair a horse can shed in the spring. Everything will be covered in here. Some of them have sensitive skin and are very particular about what brushes they like and what they don't. So you have to be very gentle and soft with some. Others like a rougher brush and are fine with it. So it's one of those things that you experiment with on your own horse, or if you're taking lessons and brush them, you can see the differences with the horses and to what they like. Another thing that's good to have is first aid supplies. So the basics of a thermometer, cotton, adhesive wrap, antiseptic wound cleanser, and clean towels. If you want to call your vet for any major issues, and even minor ones, or the ones that you think that are minor, can turn into something major. One thing you need to do is to learn to take your horse's vital signs. So their temperature, pulse, and respiration. So that's where the thermometer, of course, comes in for their temperature, and their pulse and respiration. 
you can listen and watch to know those. This is a picture of a back leg being wrapped and there's the cotton, that sterile cotton underneath and the adhesive wrap or vet wrap is going over the top of it. Your vet can show you how to wrap a leg for your trainer and it is something you need to practice and if done improperly can injure your horse further. So it's something you need to do correctly. So horse tack, so the things you put on your horse to ride them and handle them. So do you have halters, lead ropes, bridles, uh, a saddle, sometimes more uh, for your horse. You need a pad to go underneath the saddle so it's not directly on the back and a girth that goes around them to keep the saddle on. There's two main varieties, English and Western, and there's different kinds of English saddles and different kinds of Western saddles. I actually use a hybrid of English and Western as an endurance saddle, so it looks kind of like both of them. So here's an example and a diagram of a Western saddle and an English saddle. So you'll see how the Western saddle is much larger than the English saddle. So Western saddles also have a horn. So when you're roping a cow, you can tie the rope around the horn. And that's why it's there. And they are more substantial saddles. So they weigh more and uh, they give you a secure seat. So the English saddle, as you see, there's a lot less to it. Uh, you have more contact with the horse, so you feel closer to them. And there's not as much keeping you in the seat, so to speak. So when you're riding, uh, there's, again, you have many options to think about. Uh, how you want to ride, do you want to show, you don't have to show. People, a lot of people go their whole lives with ever showing. It does give you a goal if you're a goal-oriented person. Uh, having a show you know, with a date and a certain set of things that you need to accomplish. Um, it's good as far as goal setting goes. And when you're taking lessons, often uh, they will go to shows in whatever discipline. So. It's something to work towards, and that's good for a lot of people. Uh, distance riding is the other is another option. So that's what I do. This is a picture of me and my horse at a NAPRAC ride, which is the North American Trail Conference. And it's a little bit different than endurance in that you also do obstacles. So they watch how you ride and judge you. So how you cross a stream, go up a hill, and then they give you man-made things to do also. Open gates, things like that. So depending on what your horse is good at um, is a lot of the reason why you choose a certain thing. Some horses are jacks or gills of all trades. So they do multiple things. Sometimes not great, but good enough. So if that's something, then you want to find an all-around horse that's okay with doing a variety of things. And they do have their own preferences. So some of them like being in an arena. Some of them like being on trail. Some of them either one. So again, when you're looking at horses to buy, those are the things to consider. So this is a video uh, from a hunter round at a horse show, and this is a large horse show. So this is a rated show. So this is not beginners riding. There is a prize. So the $2,500 that you win um, doesn't pay <laughs> to get you to the show. So you're not making any money. So the person, um, the owner, the trainer, um, everything that you have to 
pay for to get there is usually much more than $2,500. And the it's three nine, so that's three feet nine inches is uh, the height that they are jumping. So the next is an example of Western writing. Uh, this is ringing. So Clinton Anderson, the person who is writing, is a well-known horse trainer and clinician. He goes all over the country giving clinics on how to ride and train your horse. He has written books, uh, made videos, and is quite well-known. So ringing is showing how you would work and in a you know a ranch and it doesn't involve cattle there are variations that do and uh but this is the pattern rating of a pattern that they show different things that they would use if there particularly was cows So the next video is endurance. So this is actually in the Mojave Desert. Uh, the endurance rides that I've done do not look so.
So that was an example of endurance of, on a very rocky, steep trail. Well, there's also unmounted horse activities. Uh, the vast majority of people who buy horses ride them, but you certainly don't have to. Uh, you can also drive them. So if you drive, you also need a cart and a harness. And there is a very active driving community not too far away uh, from Central Texas in College Station, the Brazos Valley Carriage Association has uh, guided drives and lots of information about driving and learning how if you're interested. So you can do other ground or unmounted activities such as obstacles where you lead your horse through a variety of obstacles and are judged on it. And costume classes uh, can be mounted or unmounted. This is an example of me and my horse dressed up uh, in as Gryffindors. He's Harry Potter. So you want to plan um, your life with horses. Uh, they are rewarding, but they are extremely expensive. So you need to know, have a plan about what you'll do if they can't be ridden anymore, um, if they get sick, all those kinds of things. You can get insurance if uh, to help with those medical costs, but the insurance you have to pay before they pay you. So you still need some means of paying for it um, if they need things like colic surgery, which is extremely expensive. The first horse uh, picture that I showed, my first one, he did end up having to have college surgery. The current one, um, he most likely can't be ridden anymore. He injured himself and he has been um, running for almost a year now. So those are the things you need to plan when you think about uh, whether you want to own them or not. Um, it is a passion and I know that many of my family would prefer that I did not have to be involved with horses because they're time consuming and expensive, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And in conclusion, uh, this is just a quote. Uh, it's one of my favorites about riding. Uh, horse is not a gentle hobby to be picked up and laid down like a game of solitaire. It is a grand passion. It seizes a person whole and once it is done so, he, she will have to accept that his life will be radically changed. And thank you for your time, and I hope you have learned something today. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> that so much, so many things. I have so many questions. Let me check first. Alyssa, did anyone have any questions and comments? Yes, there was a few questions. Um, okay, so... let's go through theirs first. Okay. Um, first question is, um, where, where would you look to lease a horse? Any specific places to look into? Usually most people lease where they take lessons. Um, they're also, uh, just like, you know, I mentioned social media many times. Um, you'll see ads on, there's lots of horse groups on Facebook. So if you're interested in a particular discipline, um, you can join the group there and uh, see if anyone has anything, um, you know, available. But most people lease them through the uh, stable that they're taking lessons at. So their trainer, either somebody who's at the barn or they know of someone who's looking for a horse, um, I mean, looking for someone to lease their horse. And like I mentioned, there's, you know, quite a few varieties of full and partial leases. Okay, thank you. Um, let me see, the next question is, let's see. Um, the next question is, is there a pretty common standard on acre size per horse on owned property? Uh, A&M recommends two acres per horse. Um, most boarding stables, I would say, um, 
do less than that, but the two acres um, is the size that you would need for a horse to keep um, the grass in the best condition and to have the least amount of damage to the land itself. Okay. Um, let me see, next question. Are you planning on watching the FEI Nationals in Omaha this weekend? Only virtually, <laughs> of course, and um, you have to pay to watch it. So um, hopefully somebody will put some of the free um, snips they often do. Um, you can see a little bit of it uh, through some of the coverage. Um, I don't subscribe to any. Um, there's like horse TV and a few of the other ones that are subscription based. Um, but uh, economically speaking, I have uh, dropped even my regular like TV streaming services. So mm -hmm. um, I'm not doing that at the moment. But yes, I do love um, I'm old. So I remember in the long ago days where they actually put, you know, um, eventing and jumping and things like that on TV for everybody to watch, which sadly they no longer do. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then I have one last question. Um, do you have any recommendations for English writing lessons in the Bell County area? Uh, there's a few. Um, the Summit Creek um, is one that's hosted through, they're at Salado, uh, they're part of Salado Creek Riding Club, and they might be full, but the trainer is, uh, she does hunter jumper, and she goes to shows and is quite active in um, the showing area. So towards Austin, there's quite a few. I mean, Austin is full of barns if you want to drive that far. Um, Scissor Tail Hill is, uh, the, one of the, it's near the airport. They do their own show series and, uh, they have a covered arena, which, um, not many people do around here. So it's nice that you can even ride in the rain. Good. Any other questions? Okay, no, that's so, it. That's it. Um, well, speaking of like areas, um, do you know of any areas that do uh, horse therapy? Because I know that's something that's really helpful to, especially autistic kids. Um, there's a few. Um, the biggest is actually in Houston. It's called Sire. But the ones around here, they actually, there's a veterans program with Mustangs in Georgetown. So, and there's another barn in a ranch in Kempner. Uh, that's doing therapy there too. So the, uh, and again, there's quite a few in Austin. There's one called um, Help. And uh, they do, uh, you know, the PATH training, which is mm -hmm. um, the accreditation basically for mounted therapy. But the uh, veterans at the, with the Mustangs, that's pretty cool. Um, it's the Mustang Heritage Foundation that's doing that. Cool, cool. How old is, like, when do they start training a horse to do horse stuff cooperatively? <laughs> like, how old? <laughs> it depends. Um, some of the Western people, um, they call it futurities. So they start them at two, um, three. They have shows at, for three-year-olds um racing horse racing they start them at two um some other people wait um longer so it's you know really depends on the discipline for endurance they have to be older to compete so they don't let three-year-olds do distance sports and because uh, they want them to be older before they do that kind of distance Okay. Um, I watched a video one time of them um, shooing or, or clearing or farrowing, what is the word, a horse. Mm -hmm. And at what point did somebody decide horses needed shoes? Because at some point in history, they did not have shoes. 
Um, that's been, they found uh, archaeological evidence of leather shoes. Um, so uh, when metal, you know, for the first shoes uh, were made of copper, so a softer metal, so they didn't, but they've been trying to put, um, you know, something on their feet so they, because they can wear them down really quickly. So, I mean, depending on the uh, material, they've tried to do that for, you know, thousands of years now. So, and they even recently found um, the evidence of people riding earlier than they thought. So there's a longer evidence of people riding horses now than there used to be. That's amazing. Well, let, let me check with Alyssa. Any more questions? No, no more questions. Okay. Well, this was fun. This was fun to, to learn all about this. And um, it's just fascinating. Now I understand why you say, uh, yeah, it's my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> I get it now. I get it. Well, we are so excited. Thank you so much for sharing this information. We we have horses here on campus. And, you know, if anyone is interested in any, any type of agricultural um, class, make sure you check it out. Because And Texas A&M as well. They're like, you know, agriculture in their name. Um, because this is an amazing field to get into. And, um, you know, if you are passionate about horses and Margaret, you're definitely passionate about horses. Um, you can see where they can really fulfill your life. So, um, thank you so much, uh, for joining us today before everybody goes, I'm going to give y'all a couple of heads ups on events next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. From 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock, we're playing Smash Brothers, and I've heard uh, also Mario Kart in the library. Um, so just come on over at lunchtime and come play some anime, uh, some uh, virtual, not virtual, video. I'll get it right, video games. Also, um, remember that we're continuing our um, military history series. So on Wednesday, April 19th, we're going to have author Terrence Ferguson talk about um, the industrial mobilization of um, an airplane factory during World War II. And it's a really fascinating story. If you've ever lived in the Grand Prairie area, definitely watch this because it'll kind of show you how Grand Prairie even got larger and why the government is able to get involved in major factory work. So that will be interesting. And then on April 24th, make sure you mark your calendars. We have those pre-recorded military stories. We have um, a veteran who is a POW for seven years during the Korean War. We've had, we have a, uh, a Navy medic. We have a lot of amazing stories from different campaigns. And so we're gonna have them uploaded on our Facebook and on our YouTube. So we hope you watch that. We also have just put our Byways winners up on our social media and we have our reception for the winners. Congratulations to all the winners. Um, we have them um, a reception on May 4th from 3.30 to 5.30. So I hope you make it. And in April, don't forget another night sky tour with um, Warren Hart, our CTC astronomer. He's going to tell us what to look for in the May sky. So lots of fun activities that are coming up. And we hope you guys will join us for all of them. Um, beautiful day today. Make sure you guys go out and enjoy it. Um, get some sunshine. So, um, all right. Uh, we will see you next time. Thanks again, Margaret. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye. Yeah.